in Luke chapter 15. It's verses 11 through 24. If you guys... Is that better? Sorry. It's off. You gotta push it. Sorry about that. So it's in, um, it's in Luke chapter 15, it's verses 11 through 24, and if you guys haven't heard the story, it's the story of the prodigal son. It's one of the parables that Jesus had taught. So it says, and he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had took and took a all that he had and took a journey to a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose across him. A severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. <coughs> And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish in hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran to him and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, br bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fat and calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this, for this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And then begin to celebrate. Thank
there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And you see what is happening here? That son, both sons had the provision of the father. To that point, they had the care of the father. The father supplied everything that they needed, cared for them, blessed their lives. They were under his protection, being fed by his hand cared for him daily. They had his provision. They had his provision. But the younger son wanted something else. He wanted the pursuit of pleasure. He wanted to pursue pleasure in his life. And in verse 13 it says, not many days later the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country and squandered his property in reckless living. So you see that there? The younger son had the provision of the father. He had that relationship with the father. But he wanted something else. He wanted to fulfill the pleasures that he was desiring from within. Have you ever experienced that in your own life? I have. Boy, have I. Even though having the love of the Father, there's something inside of us that's called a sin nature that we still have, even as believers, even as children of God, we still have that part inside of us that longs to be fulfilled with the pleasures of this life. And you know what? He gives us the freedom and the free will to go and chase those pleasures. To go and chase them, even though he has something that's better. And you know that far country, understand something about that far country. It's not so much a place, a place of a great distance away, physically speaking. But, can, but you know what? You know how it starts? Just with an alienation inside of our hearts. It's that alienation inside of our hearts. When God is asking us to do something and we start saying, no, I just don't want to do that. Or he's asking us not to do something and we start saying, no, I really want to do that. And what happens when we choose that thing over him? There begins an alienation within our heart. Not on his part. Not on his part, but on ours. And we gradually just start to drift away, little by little, inside our hearts, in our hearts, right? Have you ever experienced that? You know what? You don't have to go away. You can be a, you can be a child of God and be a believer and sit in the church for years and years and years. And you can still have that alienation between you and Him developing inside of your hearts. How do I know this? I've done it. I've done it. And I understand it. I understand how you can just little by little, just by saying no to him, you just start drifting away a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. And at first you're saying, oh, Father, forgive me. I shouldn't have done that. Oh, Father, help me to stop that. Oh, Father, I'm turning back to you. And you do it again. You do it again. And the more you do it, you just start drifting away a little bit more at a time. A little bit more. A little bit more. In your heart. And you feel that alienation there. Again, he doesn't leave you. He's not going to leave you. But you can drift away. And this is what always happens when we pursue pleasure and pride. Because it's not just our pleasure, it's also our pride that says, I want to do what I want to do. I don't want anybody else telling me what to do. I want to do it my way. And we start singing that Frank Sinatra song. I did it my way. I did it my way. Right? Because you got to be old to get that done. <laughs> 
But you can choose that. You can say, Father, just like this, just like this son said, just like this son said, I want to do it my way. I want the freedom to make my own decisions. I want to be free, free, to do whatever I want to do. Right? Haven't we all been there? Boy, I was. So what happens when we do that? What happens when we say that to God? I want to be free. I want to do what I want to do. Don't tell me what to do. This is what always happens next. Or eventually. Sometimes it takes many years. Sometimes it takes a long time. But it'll happen. Sure enough. We plunge. We're plunged into poverty. It may not be a financial property, but it will be a poverty in our soul. And if there will be a famine in our soul, there will be an emptiness that will come, a dryness. Something that says, oh, I'm not fulfilled. Something that just, just makes you feel so empty inside there. Right? You know what that's like? You understand that? That's what happens when you say to him, I want to go my own way. I want to make my decisions. We are plunged into pitiful poverty. You notice I'm using all P words. Mm -hmm. Because the, the son had the provision of the father. He had, instead, he decided the pursuit of pleasure and pride. And what came next was plunged into pitiful poverty. Okay, you'll be happy to know I'm done with the P words. <laughs> no more. All right? So what comes next? What comes next? In verse 17, let's move on to verse 17. What happens? But when he came to his, himself, he said... How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. You know what he was brought to? Reality. Reality. The reality of his state. The reality of the consequences that the freedom that he thought he was going to pursue and gain, the reality of that, met face to face. And he had to face reality. And when he faced reality, he came out of that self-deception. He came out, he stopped lying to himself and said, boy, I'm in trouble. He came to the place where he could say, I need help. I need help. And he says, how many of my fathers, how many of my fathers hired servants have more than enough bread to spare. And they truly do. And they always will. Because he cares for them. And they will. What is, you know what it says in the Psalms? What David said in the Psalms? I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging for bread. Because that is the careful provision of your Father, of your Heavenly Father. I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging for bread. That is his provision for you. But back to reality. All right? So, he came to himself. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. Reality. What came next? Repentance. In verse 18. Verse 18, the best thing he could do, the best thing he could do in that situation, repent. What does he say? I will rise and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired servants. Repentance. Repentance. That's the only that's the only wise thing he can do. 
That is the only wise and sensible thing you can do when you're in that situation, when you have strayed from God. Repent. Turn back. What does repentance mean? What does that word repentance mean? It means a change of mind. It means you change your mind. And when you change your mind, you change your direction. Instead of walking away from God and doing your own thing and pursuing the freedom that you so love, you run to Him. You run to Him and you say, I want you. Forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. And see here, notice. The true marks of repentance, you know what they are? You never make an excuse for what you did. Never make an excuse because there is no excuse. And you never blame anybody else for your actions. You never make an excuse. You know, never make an excuse that you have some kind of psychological disorder that is making you do the things that you do. Anybody who is in that state who thinks that they have some kind of psychological d disorder that makes them do the things that they do can't repent. Because you know what they're saying? God, you have made me with this situation in my life that you can't fix because you're too weak. I have this problem in my life that you're just too weak to fix. That's an insult, isn't it? You're insulting the sovereign God, the, the one who's created the universe. If he created that giant ball of fire in the sky, do you think he can fix you? I think so. He created the universe. Do you think his problems are any issue for him? No. No. They are teeny, teeny, weeny pipsqueaks for him. They're so nothing. And he loves you. And he wants to help you with those things. He wants to fix those things in your life. Because he cares about you. Because he is the perfect father. All we need to do is come to him in repentance and say, help. Help me. I turn away from these those things. And I turn to you. Forgive me for them. Help me. You know what? It's what David said. It's all David said. Psalm 51. Read it. It's the psalm of repentance. He said, Father, I have sinned against you and you only. He made no excuses. He blamed nobody else. But took responsibility for his own actions. Repentance. That's what the Father wants to see. And you know what the Father was interested in? This was all what the Father was interested in. It's in, it's in chapter or verse 20. This is what the Father, this is what's in his heart. And he arose, speaking of the Son, and the Son arose and came to his Father. But while he was still a long way off, his Father saw him and felt compassion, and ran, and embraced him, and kissed him. And the son said to the father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be your son. But what did the father do? Even before he said any of that, the father ran and hugged him. He ran down the road, hugged him, kissed him. You know what all the only thing the father wanted is that son back. He wanted that relationship to be reconciled between him and his son. And you see the heart of God for you. Don't let, any, don't let a minute go by where you are not reconciled in that relationship to the Heavenly Father. You know why? You know how valuable that relationship and that reconciliation between you and God is? It is so valuable to him that he would send his son to hang on that cross 
for you and for me so that we would never be, there would never be separation between you and God. That you would continually be in a state of reconciliation but with Him. That there would never be a break. Never. That's what the Father wanted. Reconciliation. That's what He is interested in. And you know what he did next? What did the father do next? Immediately after reconciliation. You know, it's called restoration. Restoration. And this, was, this is the picture of restoration. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly now the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fat calf and kill it and let's celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. So what's the first thing he says? He says, bring the best robe. You know what the, you know what the robe represents all through scripture? You know what? From beginning to end of the scriptures, the robe represents righteousness. The robe of righteousness. The robe represents righteousness. In Zechariah chapter 3 verse 4. It's, this is what it says. Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken away your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments, which means robes. I will clothe you. And you know what? That is what Jesus Christ has purchased with, for you. He's removed your sin, your iniquity, and he has clothed you with clean garments, pure garments. That's what Christ has purchased for you on that cross. You know how he did it? You know how this is how Christ did it? He took your dirty garments. He took your filth and your sin and your iniquity. And he took it, he put it upon himself. And you know what he did? He carried it up that hill to that cross. And you're, and it was paid for there. And you know what he did? Because he did that, he could do this. He took his clean, perfect robe of righteousness and he wrapped it around you. And you are wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ this day. And you wear it like a robe before God. You wear it so that you can enter into the presence of God pure and clean. Perfect before Him. Acceptable. You know why? Because you are wrapped in the robe of righteousness, which is Jesus Christ. He gave it to you. That's what the scripture says. Romans chapter 4. Go read it. He imputed it to you. He imputed his righteousness to you, and he imputed your filth, your sin, your iniquity to himself and paid for it so that you would never have to. What a wonderful thing. Isn't that wonderful? So that you could every day come before God in righteousness, perfect, and that's all he sees. All he sees is the righteousness of Jesus Christ all over you. How glorious. That's how you can go before him. That's what makes you acceptable to him. That's how he removes your guilt. And what did he do next? He gave him a ring. He gave the son a ring. It's, that's what it says. He said, bring the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand. Why did he give him a ring? Well, you need to understand the ring, you need to look through the rest of Scripture, what it says about the ring. It's very important. You need a ring. You know what? If you have come to Christ, He has given you a ring. What does that ring mean? Well, let me show you. In Esther chapter 8, verse 2, and it says, The king took off his signet ring. 
which he had taken from Haman. Haman was the enemy of the Jews. You know the story of Esther. Haman was the bad guy who was trying to destroy Haman and all the Jews, right? Wanted to wipe them out, sending people to kill them, wanted to destroy them, destroy God's people, all right? Esther goes before the king, pleads, pleads for her life and the life of her people. This is what the king does. Haman gets hung on its own gallows, and this is what he does. And he took the signet ring, which he had taken from Haman. He took Haman's ring. He took the ring that he had given originally to Haman. That, that ring was authority. That ring was the authority of God. Sorry. It was the authority of the king. For us, it's the authority of God. That ring was the authority of the king. And he gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over, listen to this, this is important. Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. So Esther gave Mordecai charge over everything that the enemy had. Over his house. He put, she put him in charge of everything. And that's what Christ does with you. You know, you know that when you come to him and when you are his child, he gives you all the authority over your enemy. Did you know that? You have all the authority over your enemy. I can see by your faces you don't believe that. Let me prove it to you. Because it is so important. It will change your life. Luke chapter 10 verse 19. Christ says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall hurt you. Do you know how wonderful that is? That is my middle of the night verse. Because when the enemy is coming after me, talking in my ear, trying to strike fear in me in the, in the middle of the night when I'm like half asleep, that's the verse I pull out. I say this to him. You know what he says to me? Oh, you're going to be lost. You're hopeless. Just give up. Don't even try to approach God. You've blown it. Don't even try to go to God. You've sinned too many times. He doesn't like you. He's really upset with you. He's disappointed with you. Don't talk to him. Go the other way. That's what the enemy speaks to me in the middle of the night. He says, you're hopeless. And tries to fill my heart with fear. And when I feel that fear rising up inside my heart, this is what I say to him. Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. You know what that does to him? It sends him running. Because the truth of the word of God dispels those lies. And he can only function through a lie. He can only operate by a lie. He can't touch you. He can't hurt you. But he can lie to you. If you'll believe him. You know what this says? I don't believe you. Because even though I am all those things and I have sinned, I have been justified by faith. Therefore, I have peace with God through my Lord Jesus Christ. Right? And he leaves. But you see, your heavenly Father has given you all authority over the power of your enemy. That means you are in charge. You will rule him. He does not, you do not let, have to let him bully you. He's just a bully. You understand that? He's a bully. You know who the bully picks on? The one who's afraid to stand up and fight. That's who the bully picks on. And Satan, the devil, he's just a bully. He's just a bully with a big mouth. All you have to do 
Stand up in the authority that God has given you. God has given you his ring of authority. He rules the universe. You do not have to allow him to trample on you. Understand that? You know what the scripture says? Resist him. That comes to my next point. And also the last thing he gave him. He said, put the best robe on him. Put a ring on his hand and put shoes on his feet. What do the shoes represent? What do the shoes represent? Anybody know? Gospel of peace. Yes, the gospel of peace. The shoes represent the gospel of peace. And that's what he has put on your feet. All right? It's in Ephesians chapter 6, 15. And it says, Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What do you do with that gospel of peace? You stand against the devil. You walk in holiness. And you run the race. That's what you do with those shoes he's given you. And the last thing that the Father did, the last thing that the Father did, he said, and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us celebrate. For this my son was dead and was alive again. He was lost and is found. Let and they began to celebrate. They began to celebrate. So you know all through scripture, it speaks about feasts. It speaks about great feasts and banquets that God the Father has. And he has invited you to that banquet. He has invited you to partake of the feast that he has prepared for you. It's in Luke chapter 14 is one of them. Just one of them. There's so many more. Luke chapter 14 verse 16 it says, Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. And that's what he says to every one of us. Come. Come to my table. Come to my table. And enjoy the feast that I have for you. That's what he says to every one of you. Come to my table and enjoy the feast that I have for you. You know what? You know why Laura had such a wonderful time when she opened up God's word? And she feasted upon those words that he spoke into her heart so personally and so lovingly. It was that love relationship, sitting down with the Heavenly Father, that He spoke to her and comforted her heart and showed her, I'm here. That is the feast that He has prepared for every one of you. For every one of us. He has that feast for us daily. To eat at His table. To enjoy breaking bread with Him. You know what, what did Christ say when the devil tempted him and he was fasting 40 days in the desert? The devil said, hey, if you're really the son of God, make this, this stone a loaf of bread. You know what Christ said to him? Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That is what will sustain you in this life. His word, his living, powerful, real word. That's what you were created to be sustained by. You know what? That's what Adam and Eve knew in the Garden of Eden until they sinned. That fellowship, that intimacy of feasting with God, of that relationship with God, that was what they loved. That's what sustained them. That's what they lost when they sinned. And they disobeyed him. And they broke that relationship. And that is what Jesus Christ has restored to us on that cross. That relationship of intimacy. That's how Laura could come to him. 
and receive from that word and her heart be filled with a joy that is so real. It's more wonderful than you can ever experience in this life. It is so real. And it's available to us every day, any day. And that's what he says. Come, I've prepared a feast for you. That's what he says. Come, let me read it again. Then he said to them, a certain man had a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at the supper time to say to those who were invited, come, come, for all things are now ready. The meal is ready. So we are not only those who are invited to feast at his table, but we're also those who go out and call to others to come. Come, come to the table. The feast is ready. God will bring a fulfillment into your life that you cannot experience in anything else. And you know what the reality is? He leaves it up to us. We have to choose for ourselves. Every person can choose. Do we, do we want to eat the slop with the pigs? To sustain us? Or do we want to feast at his table? He will not force us. But he says to us, come. Come to that table. My meal is ready for you. I prepared a meal for you that will sustain you through this life. Through, that will satisfy your soul like nothing else can. And I encourage you this week. I encourage you this week. Go to that table. You know what? Christ made the way. Christ opened the door. That he would never turn anybody away. So that he would never turn anybody away. That just by faith. That just by faith. Comes through Christ. Comes through Christ. Never turned anybody away. Come to the table. I encourage you that this week. Do that. Practice it. Get up in the morning and seek him. Come to that table. Open up his word. Find out what it says to you about your life and he will speak to you. I promise you he will. He's been doing it for me for 40 years. I've been opening up his word and he has given me a feast. He has set a feast before me. That has satisfied my soul. Didn't do anything right to get it either. Except just come. Amen. Amen. Let's pray and then Carol's going to come up. Okay.